Hi, everyone. As everyone comes in, thank you for joining us for day three of SAT prep streams. Let us know in the chat where you're coming from. You want to say hi. I see a couple of people that were here last night. So welcome back. And I see, I think I see a couple of new, new names. So welcome. Aya, ah, yeah. Texas. Hi, Ada. Hi, Samya. I hope I'm saying names right. Ah, New York. I'm also in, we're both in New York. Yes. Oh, I'm glad I said it right. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have anyone on the West Coast? Hope you're staying safe. So we'll, we'll give it a couple more minutes for, for folks to join. Okay, we might go ahead and get started. I kind of have a feeling that since Friday night, a lot of people might end up watching this recording, um, but we're gonna go ahead and get started. Thanks, for, thanks to everyone who's joining us live. We're excited to be here with you again, day three. This is our last SAT prep stream that we're doing. Um, so get in all of your questions. We'll try to make sure we answer them at the end or um, we'll also give out like an email that you can ask your questions to if we don't get a chance to get to them. So uh, for anyone who doesn't know, my name is Lisa. I am CEO of Almost Fun and I'm joined by Grace Garcia. She is our chief academic officer. And together we uh, were leading this organization called Almost Fun, which focuses on creating engaging and inspiring learning materials to help make that learning experience more fun for you. We also, we both went through the college application process in 2012, which was a while ago now, but um, at times can still feel pretty fresh. And we both ended up going to Harvard College. And so we're happy to answer any questions about that about navigating, you know, applying to Ivy Leagues or, or not, um, and help you guys through that process. But the main focus of these, of this session is going to be on SAT reading and writing strategies. So our focus is going to be helping you with timing, helping you with the different types of questions and passages, and making sure that you feel well prepared. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to pull up my screen. Okay, cool. So the first thing that we're going to just go over is the general format for reading and writing. So for the reading section, there are 52 questions, and you'll be given 65 minutes, so a little bit more than an hour, and then you'll get about 75 seconds per question, so a little bit more than a minute. And then in the writing section, there are 44 questions, you're given 35 minutes, so you get about 48 seconds per question, so uh, less than a minute. And that kind of makes sense because with the reading section, you need a little bit of time to read through the passages um, and not just focus on answering the questions, but also understanding what the passages are about. So you get a little bit more time allocated per question there. And again, we talked about this yesterday and the night before, but there is no penalty for guessing. So when the teacher or your proctor says like, two minute warning or one minute warning, then go back towards the ones that you didn't answer or had trouble with and just guess. Because all you can do is increase your score, you can't decrease your score by guessing. Um, so make sure that you go back and you put in your best guess or random guess. I always put in C or B because I don't know, I don't like putting in A or D for a random guess, but do whatever you want and just make sure that you populate an answer into those questions. So we're going to start by going through SAT reading section strategies, and then we'll do some practice questions, and then we'll do the same thing for writing. And throughout all of this, please ask your questions through the Q&A feature. 
Um, you can also ask your questions through chat if you don't want them to be public in Q&A, but it's just gonna be a lot easier for us to manage them if you put them in Q&A. We'll know which ones we want to surface live and talk about and discuss. And then Grace will try and answer as many as possible directly through the Q&A feature. So cool, let's get started. With the reading section, there are two different strategies that we generally recommend, and you should try both of them out to see which one works best for you. With the first strategy, we are never really going to read the whole passage, and we're also not going to start by reading the passage. We're going to focus on the questions that point us to specific parts of the passage, answer those, and like through that, get a pretty good understanding of what's happening to then go back and answer the broader questions. So let's go through an example from a practice test to give you an idea of what I mean. So this is, a, this is the first passage on the reading section in this practice test. We are not going to start reading it at all. We're going to jump directly to the questions. And anytime we see a question that doesn't point us to a specific part of the passage, or that doesn't have like a really strong keyword, like a unique keyword that we can go to, we are going to skip it and just kind of remember what it was that it was asking. So when we look at this first question, it's asking us, the narrator of the passage can best be described as blank. This is not pointing us to a specific part of the passage, so we're gonna skip it and just remember that we need to know at some point who the narrator is. We'll go to question two. In the passage, three-step is mainly presented as a blank. Again, this doesn't point us to a specific part of the passage. We could go and try and look for three-step, but generally these like setting type questions, you're not gonna get from one sentence. It'll take a little bit more to get an idea of what the answer is. So we're going to skip this and just remember, so far we need to figure out the narrator and the setting. We don't know those yet. Now let's look at question three it can reasonably be inferred from the passage that some of the people at the train station regard Miss Spivey's comment about the Georgia heat with blank. Okay, this is one that has some really strong keywords in it. We know that we're at a train station, Miss Spivey is saying something about the Georgia heat. And the good thing about these questions is that these really specific detailed ones are gonna go in order of the passage. So it's gonna be somewhere at the beginning because this is an earlier question. So we'll go back to our passage we are going to skim a little bit, and then we're going to see, ah, here she's talking about the Georgia heat. She's saying, August was a hellish month to step off the train in Georgia, although it was nothing she said compared to the 119 degrees that greeted her when she arrived one time in Timbuktu. I believe her remark irritated some of the people gathered to welcome her. When folks are sweating through their shorts, they don't like to hear that this is nothing compared to someplace else. Okay, so she's talking about how it's hot, but it's not as hot as other places and people are kind of annoyed because they feel really warm and overheated. So when we go back to our choices, the people at the train station, they're not feeling sympathy for her. That doesn't really describe annoyance. They're not feeling disappointment in her. They're also not really embarrassed but they are resentful. They're like irritated and annoyed that she's saying that this is not that bad when they themselves feel like this is pretty bad. So you see how this question we were able to answer by just finding a specific part of the passage that we could take a look at instead of trying to read through this whole thing and then remember where this was. So that's, that's kind of this first strategy. And let's do another example to show you how by doing this, you're going to get the answers to some of these previous questions that we skipped. So if we, let's say that we've gotten our, we've gotten down to question six. The interaction between Miss Spivey and Ralph Ford, Ralph Ford, yeah, serves mainly to blank. So we're looking for an interaction between Miss Spivey and a character named Ralph Ford, which is a pretty unique name. So that's what I'm gonna be looking for. So I'm gonna scroll back up here. I'm gonna skim until I find Ralph Ford here. When my little brother Ralph Ward asked what she did study at Barnard College, Ms. Spivey explained that Barnard, which she wrote on the blackboard, was the sister school of Columbia University of which she expected we had all heard of. So here, his, the narrator's little brother is asking about this college and Ms. Spivey's like, it's called Barnard College. I can't believe you don't know what that is, basically. So our answer to this specific question, 
we can see it's not that it's that she's it's suggesting that Ms. Spivey has like an over exaggerated view of what information people should know right she's surprised that these young children don't know what Barnard College is um, and through that we kind of have this impression actually that these these two kids and the narrator and his little brother are Miss Spivey's students right and if we were to go back into that section here that we just looked at we actually know that she told us that on the first day of school right before that section about Ralph Ford which we probably would have caught as we were skimming to find the word Ralph Ford and so that helps us answer that first question the narrator of the passage can best be described as it's not going to be Miss Spivey's predecessor it's not the teacher before her it's not an anonymous member of the community it's definitely not Miss Spivey herself. It is one of her students, or in this case, it's apparently one of her former students. So this is that first strategy really, where we are focusing on the questions like question three or question four or question five, which points us to a line that we can easily answer without having read the whole passage. And this way we're going to read like enough of the passage to actually answer the more general questions of like setting of like motivation of the character of like who the narrator is who the main character is this is the strategy that i most prefer um, when i was taking the sat i would use this strategy and focus on the ones i didn't know and then if i got back to the general ones and i still wasn't super sure i would like try and skim any of the parts that i hadn't read to try and get the answer but this way I wasn't like reading it all multiple times. I was at most reading each part of the passage once and I wasn't having to repeat myself. The second strategy is that you do some serious speed reading. So this is a strategy that I have seen work really well for some students, especially ones who already tend to skim a lot and speed read a lot. That doesn't happen to be me, but that might be you. So we're gonna go through this strategy and we're going to practice it with that original passage. So the whole idea here is that you're going to train yourself basically as if you were a speed reading Olympic athlete to read really, really freaking fast. So I'm gonna time you and I'm gonna give you 20 seconds to skim through this so that you get an idea of what that feels like. So on your marks, get set, go, skim. Just the first paragraph. Okay, stop. That was 20 seconds. So I don't know how many of you were able to get through all of it, but I'm guessing that a couple, at least a couple of you maybe only got halfway through or even a quarter way through, a couple sentences through. This kind of skimming is pretty hard, but once you get in the practice of it, it becomes easier. Our goal is that we're not going to be reading every single word here. We're really just like skimming, trying to find the keys, the key words here that stand out that are unique and pull those out so we have a general understanding of what is in this paragraph. And when we see a question that might be related to it, we'll know to come back here. And one good thing to also do while you're doing this is to just like if you had this as a piece of paper, you know, on test day to underline things that you see that seem to be important. So when you go back and you scan to try and answer questions, you have an idea of what those keywords are. So like if we were skimming this, we'd be like, okay, Miss Grace Spivey, three step, she arrives here, she steps off the train. She says it's a really hot month, but it's nothing compared to this other place. Other people were irritated. They didn't like to hear that this isn't anything compared to other places, but they were still excited to see her. And yeah, that's all we really need to know is that there's this new woman arriving. She's kind of complaining and people are kind of annoyed, but they're still excited about her because she's a new teacher. So that's, the, that's what you're practicing here is really skimming this quickly. And if we were to do this and spend about 20 seconds per paragraph, this gives us like we end up being able to skim through all of this in about two minutes. That's really good timing to then be able to have enough time to answer the questions. Because what you don't want is to carefully read this as if you were like, you know, reading a textbook or a novel that you really loved 
and then spend like 10 minutes reading this before you get to the question, right? Because you only have a little more than a minute to answer every question. And that's including the, the time that you would spend reading. So those are the two different strategies. Try each one. Um, I would recommend like see if this first one works for you. If you find that you're getting a lot of questions wrong or that you're really not able to find those keywords, that's not easy for you to do, then start really focusing on strategy two. And strategy two might not come easily at first, but after practicing using your phone's timer, really like, you know, focusing on skimming as much as you can, it will become, you'll, you'll get more used to it. Like I have past students I've worked with have like, we've practiced it in class over and over again to the point where when they're reading, they like kind of hear my annoying voice in their ear being like, start, stop, start, stop, like every 20 seconds. And that's, that's what you want to get in the practice of, of like really reading these quickly. So those are our general strategies. Now, we also have strategies for each specific type of passage. So in the reading section, you'll get like roughly four different types of passages. You'll get fiction passages like the one we just read. You'll get a historical passage, which is like an old speech that someone gave or like an old argument someone gave for some important issue back in the day. You'll get a scientific passage, which talks about like an experiment or something that is being explored and newly understood. And then you'll get paired passages, which is when you get two passages and you have to answer questions about both of them. So we have a couple tips for each of these different passages. For fiction passages, yeah. I didn't, I tried to catch you before you moved in. Um, so I think we have, so we have two questions that I feel like would be great to have answered um, on live. And one of them, the first one is, what are your thoughts on reading the questions be first before reading? So again, like I think your, your focus is going to be on reading everything as little as possible or as few times as possible. If you read all the questions first, especially when you're kind of stressed and anxious, you might not actually remember what all the questions were asking you. And you're going to have to go back and read them really carefully again. Like I tend to see when students do that, a lot of time being wasted. And so that's why our first strategy is more focused on actually trying to answer them instead of just reading them, going to read the whole passage and then reading them again and then going back to the passage to find your answer. Um, now every student's different. So if for you specifically, you find that like one pass through the questions, you like know for sure what the different questions are being asked. When you go read the passage, you can just like find the answer and go back and answer each one like that. Then you should do that. That might be the strategy that works best for you. I've just seen a lot of students who do actually struggle with that method just because of the time pressure involved. Awesome. And then the second question, which I guess we can both answer was, what technique did we use on the SAT, option one or option two? Uh, the answer for me is that I didn't know about this. And so I unfortunately actually read through um, the whole passage and tried to answer as, much as, I can, as many as I could, um, which resulted in my reading section of my score being much lower than how I did with math. Um, so I definitely recommend using the strategies that Lisa is sharing with you guys tonight. Yeah, I, I definitely like strategy one a little bit more because um, I tend to get very stressed and anxious during the test. And so speed reading can kind of make me feel even more anxious. Um, if I get to just focus on one question at a time and go back and, and try and find the answers, that's just a little bit easier for me. Um, and I can focus on one thing at a time. But again, it really depends on what kind of student you are. So I would recommend trying both and seeing which one works best for you. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, okay. On to the different types of passages. So fiction passages are like the one we just read and you'll probably remember that like a couple of the things that we were being asked for were the setting. This is really common that they'll want you to know like where is this passage taking place? What are some details about it? Um, you'll also be asked who the character, who the characters are, like who is the main character, what are they doing and why, are they interacting with other people, how are they feeling, like all these details about that main character in the story. And then you will almost certainly be asked who the narrator is, right? Is it someone in the story? Is it someone who is just like a neutral bystander describing the situation or is it, you know, someone much more important to the core story? 
And then this fourth part is the hardest one. Um, I don't know if you've ever felt this where like you read the same thing, you read for like 10 minutes and like you still don't really know what happened and you have to go back and read it again, especially if it's content that's like not that interesting and you just end up staring at this like paragraph of words for minutes at a time wondering where you went wrong. So that's why we recommend like underlining or like highlighting and taking little notes. That's like a method of actively reading um, because really you want to be able to follow the action in any fiction passage. You want to be able to say like, this is where we started and this character went and did this action and another character responded this way or like the whole event changed because of their actions. Like you want to be able to follow the plot basically of this passage as if you were watching it as a movie or something like that. Because a lot of the questions are gonna be about the plot. They're gonna be about, you know, how did, like in the example we looked at, how did the people that were watching this woman step off the train react to the things she was saying? Or like, why was this interaction between the student and the teacher important? Those are all plot related questions. So those are things you wanna keep an eye out for. So a uh, quick question, I think this question is still uh, is related to fiction. Um, Nikki had a question about like how to go about identifying like hidden meanings or ideas implied through a character's speech. That's a good question. Let's see if we can find an example. So, so yeah, so this one is kind of a good example. Let's look at sec question five because that's a little bit different. So we have Miss Spivey most likely uses the phrase fruitful intermission line 26 to indicate blank. So we're gonna go to line 26. So we're trying to figure out like, why does she use these words, right? And there's maybe some hidden meaning behind there. The key to these questions is really the context, right? Like what is going on in the rest of the sentence? If we were to, if those words weren't there and we had to kind of guess, if we ourselves were to put in the words that we thought would belong based on the rest of the sentence, what would we put on? What would we put in that's like the simplest language? So if we're looking at this, the context here, we have that she was, by almost anyone's standards, a woman of the world. So she's super cultured. She'd gone to boarding school since she was six years old. She studied French in Paris and drama in London. And during what she called a, quote, fruitful intermission in her formal education, she had traveled extensively in, near, in the Near East and Africa with a friend of her grandmother's. So this is like she's taking a break, but she's trying to give it some important value, right? It was fruitful, it was productive. And so she like took in, took a break from her formal education, but it was still super beneficial. It's like you're trying to justify a vacation. And so we get that not from specifically her words maybe, but more from like the context that she's talking about, the situations she's describing. So when we go back here to indicate that A, she benefited from taking time off, that seems good because it means that it was productive. Her travels with Janet Miller encouraged her to start medical school. Don't know where that's coming from. Her early years at boarding school resulted in unanticipated rewards. Don't know what that means. What she thought would be a short break from school lasted several years. That's also not quite right. So our best answer here is going to be choice A. And we're getting that not just from the words that she's using here, but from the context that she's using. Um, you're never going to be asked a question that's like, that has an answer that's so hidden that you couldn't find some textual evidence. I always say like any answer you put, you should be able to point back to the sentence that makes you feel like that answer is correct, right? And sometimes the SAT actually forces you to do that with like this question here. Question four asks us what choice provides the best evidence to this question here. That's like the practice that you should be doing actually for every question, which is when I'm answering this, I need to be able to point to the evidence in the text that makes me feel confident that this is the right answer. If I can't do that, then it's probably not the right answer. Awesome, thank you. Okay, cool. Let's move on to history. So historical passages, these are ones that are given by historical figures and they're in super formal language. I have a really hard time reading through these, but what's really funny about these is that even though they feel super long and like they drag on, you can actually get rid of a lot of the stuff in it and reduce the length of it to just like what you really need to know. And I'll give you an example here. So we'll look at the passage in a minute, but this is an excerpt from it. So in this paragraph, this is like 15 lines long. What we realize is that it's the same 
type of question asked over and over and over again. Like people love to do this in speeches where they repeat things over and over again. It's like how we keep repeating that you should guess on the SAT or like that there are certain skills we want you to remember. The more times you repeat something, the more likely someone will remember. And historical speeches love to do this. They repeat things over and over again. But for you as the reader of this, you do not need to read all of them. You just wanna get an idea of the main meaning that's coming through. So here, if we read like that first sentence, but admitting it to be a political question, have we no interest in the welfare of our country? So this is like a rhetorical question. Are we not interested in how well our country is doing? Let's read the second one. May we not permit a thought to stray beyond the narrow limits of our own family circle and of the present hour. Okay, so that's another question. Like, should we not think beyond like our own little family? So all of these questions we'll notice like start with the same thing of like, may we, must we? changing it up, shall we? Like, but it's all that same idea of like, should we not feel this way? Should we not care? Should we not be doing more? And so we don't need to read all of them. We kind of like, are, we can skim and see like, oh, this is kind of the same. This is kind of the same. This is kind of the same. Maybe I don't need to read this carefully and understand exactly what she's saying here. And if we look at this passage, let me make sure I get to the right one. If we look at this passage here, like this ends up being, you know, almost an entire, oh, wait, where am I? Um, it ends up being like almost an entire paragraph, if I can find it. And you can like reduce all of that so that you're not reading that whole thing. So I'll give you another example here because I can't find that specific one, but here we have, whether the laborer shall receive the reward of his toil or be driven daily to unrequited toil. And then we have this repetition, whether he shall walk erect, whether his bones and sinews shall be his own, whether his child shall receive the protection of its natural guardian. Like all of this is repetition. This is like, you know, about 10 lines long and we don't need to read all of it. And we have some signs that there's repetition with these hyphens, you know, where it's indicating like we're giving more examples, we're getting more examples that we really only need to read this first part and then the ending part to get an idea of what's important here. We have some other examples here. Oh, this is the one that we were talking about with the may we's, may we's, must we, shall we. Like see how long this goes on for before she finally answers the rhetorical question, no. Like the events of the last few years have cast their dark shadows and, and that's where our, our speech here is progressing. Like we don't need to have understood every single sentence here. So that's something to just keep in mind of when you're reading these historical passages is like, do you, are you starting to see, you know, the same pattern of sentence over and over again? And if so, you know, skip it, try and find where it starts to look different, where there's starting to be new meaning and new things that you can, uh, you can try and understand. Okay, so those are historical passages. Let's keep going to science. So science passages are usually about science ideas. And there are a couple of things that you want to pay close attention to here. You want to be able to identify the hypothesis. So like what is the idea or the concept that this passage is trying to understand or prove? You also want to be able to identify the experiment. So what are they doing to try and understand this hypothesis? And then you want to be able to identify the results. So what were the results of this experiment? Did it prove the hypothesis? Did we learn something else entirely new? And then we want to be able to read and comprehend the data that comes with it because I think it's like nine times out of 10, a science passage will include like a chart or a graph or something. So let's take an ex example of this. Mm, which one did I want to use? Yeah, this one. Okay, so this is like a pretty hard one to actually read through. And we are going to practice skimming a little bit as we read through this. So I'm gonna skim it with you just to be cautious of time. Um, but you can also go back and practice this on your own. These are all available at the College Board so you can take a look at them. Okay, so in the early 1990s, there were, we thought there were two types of nerves. There are slow conducting nerves, and there are, those respond to pain and, temp, pain and temperature. Then there's fast signaling nerves, which also give information. Um, let's see, 
experiments blocking nerve fibers supported this idea that there's two types. And yeah, so basically we have two types of nerves here, setting some context for us about what this concept is that we're talking about. We still haven't gotten to the hypothesis yet though, so we're not gonna spend too much time here. We wanna get to the meat of it. So here in this first sentence here, we'll get the hypothesis. So Hakan Olesan and his Gothenburg University colleagues, Aki Balbo and Johan Westberg, wondered if slow fibers responsive to gentle pressure might be active in humans as well as in other mammals. So that's our hypothesis. These three, four, no, three scientists are trying to figure out if slow fibers are responsive to gentle pressure and if those are active in humans and other mammals. And then right after that, we're gonna get the setup for the experiment. They got 28 volunteers, they tested them. We're not gonna go too deep into the science here. We just really wanna know like they, they're using this technique, they have an experiment, and then we want to find the results. So they showed that the soft stroking prompted two different signals, one immediate and one delayed. So that means that what they found was that there was slow fibers and fast fibers that both responded to gentle pressure, which is what we were trying to prove or what they were trying to prove in the first place. So see how we were through this paragraph, they give us a couple of things. They give us the hypothesis, they give us the experiment, and then they give us the results. And then in this particular passage, they end up wanting to know more. So they end up asking another question of why exactly humans have these fibers, which only respond to very subtle sim stimuli, like a gentle pressure, or gentle brush. And so we set up another experiment and find new results. And so this particular passage actually ends up having two experiments, two hypotheses, two sets of results that are then going to be asked about within the questions. But those are like the main parts of this passage that are going to be important for us. Okay. Let's keep going to the last type that you'll get. This is where you have two passages. So these passages will be related in like one of two ways. Usually either they're going to be similar or different opinions about the same topic, or one is going to set up context for another one. So like maybe one is someone giving their point of view on urban traffic. And then the other one is someone being like, oh wow, that is really interesting. Let me add this additional idea about traffic. Or something like that. So the first half of the questions, and I'll show you, are really going to be focused on each individual passage. So see here we have passage one and passage two. And if we look at the questions, the first couple are going to be like really focused on either passage one, this is still focused on passage one, or this one is on passage two. So we're not getting really any comparison contrast yet. But then when we get to question 39, we get this one that's like, what do they both express admiration for? Something that's comparing both of the passages. And hopefully through like either the skimming technique or through answering each of these individually, you will be able to answer this question and have an idea of what it is. But really that's, that's kind of the structure is they start the first half off with like individual questions on the passages and then toward the end, they start to ask you questions about both passages. Okay, I'm gonna pause really quick for any questions. I feel like I saw some pop up. Oop, I forget. Okay, sorry, I couldn't get myself unmuted. Um, so a question that uh, a student had was, when it comes to paired questions, so questions that rely on another, um, any tips for how to approach those? Um, the follow question was like, like, it, like if it asks you a question and then asks you to provide the best evidence, um, is there like a way that you can use what's in those two questions to help you answer it faster? Are these two separate questions? They're the same. So I, I think, and uh, Nikki, correct me if I'm wrong. I think the question that was trying to get through was like for the case with the train station lady, I can't remember her name, yeah. um, where they were asked to provide the best evidence for the, their answer to the previous question and there are lines provided. Um, is there ways that you can, like, should you use, should you first like check out those lines um, and then answer the question that came before it? Or if there's any like general strategies about how to, yeah, how to okay. solve like questions that depend on each other. 
Yeah, so for the passage, for the double passage one, I'll do that first. Um, basically, you want to treat these initial questions, the ones on each specific passage, the same exact way that you would have treated them before when there was only one single passage. And then once you get to the questions about both, ideally you'll at this point have like a pretty good idea of what's being talked about in each one. Um, and that should be able to help you answer those questions. And again, for these paired passage ones, like we don't wanna pick a choice that is really strong for passage one and then for passage two, we're kind of like, eh, like maybe, so this answer works. Like, again, you should be able to point to evidence from both passages that tell you that your answer is the right one. And then going back to that citing textual evidence one, that is a great point and that can be super helpful. Like if I pick an answer here, like if I picked disappointment because they doubt that she'll stay in three step very long and then none of these lines indicate disappointment about that, that is my hint that choice B is incorrect. Um, I also see some students who like to read these four first and then see which of them match to it that's another thing that you can do, but it does require you to be like super hyper aware of like where these questions are and then working backwards. So like try what works for you. Um, but I think like one good way is to answer this one and then see if any of these match. If they don't, then go back in and rethink about that question. Awesome. And then um, this last question is very much subjective, but from your perspective, which one do you think is the easiest passage type on the SAT? I think fiction's easiest um, because it reads a little bit more comfortably and like they're mostly going to use words that are familiar and um, easily understandable. Like the history passages are super dense. Um, like I was even, oh, where did it go? It's over here. They're, these are just like super dense, right? Like the sentences go on for like 12 lines because there's so many like commas and extra language. Like, People back then really like to use almost run on sentences, but like not quite. Um, so that can be kind of hard to read and follow. And then with the science passages, like sometimes it can also be kind of hard to follow. Just like what are the, these are all new concepts most likely. So like what exactly are they, are they trying to tell you? The key here is like, don't get too caught up with the vocab. Um, don't get too caught up trying to understand like each and every detail here. We want like big picture, like what is the experiment, what's happening? Um, and then paired passages, there's, there's like a little bit of added complication because you're comparing the two passages. So like overall, I find fiction to be a little bit easier. But, you know, if you are super strong in science and like, you know, really like reading papers, you might find the science ones to be a little bit easier. All right. Okay, so these are like general overall strategies for like reading through the passages and like finding the answer. But the thing about the reading section is like, there's still a lot of different core skills. Um, so we've kind of broken it out into like the different categories of questions. There's, you know, your summarization questions. There's ones that like require you to find the details. That's reading closely. There's the paired passages. Um, there's ones that ask you about the meanings of words. This one, this category is actually kind of interesting. Let me just show you something that I think is worth noting, which is that in the past, like maybe five or 10 years ago on the SAT, they really liked to test complicated vocabulary, like really tough words and like see if you could answer it, you see if you knew the meaning. They don't do that anymore. What they've decided to do now is to use really common words that you're really likely to know, like matches or clean but these are always gonna be words that have like a couple different meanings that could be used. And you have to identify like, what is the meaning that's being used in the context of this passage? And you don't have to read that much. Like you again, only need to read like the specific line. So if we were to do this question and go to line 68 here. Um, and I heard a sound as clean and pure as a small silver bell. Like this tells us it's like a very, like there's not a ton of noise around it. It's one note, it's very clean, it's pure. And when we go back here, like the one that most likely is that meaning is gonna be distinct, right? It's one distinct, pure sound. There's not a ton of like other noise around it. Um, and one thing that you can do here is take each of these words and like replace it, replace clean with it and just see if it reads well. So like, and I heard a sound as complete and pure as a small silver bell. 
nah, but like distinct is gonna sound a lot better. And I heard a sound as distinct and pure as a small silver bell it just sounds a little bit better. Um, so yeah, that's the interesting part about those types of questions. There's, <coughs> excuse me. There's also questions on like text structure, which we are actually gonna go through a couple of so you get an idea of these. Um, and the key to note for, for our passages is like, our passages are gonna be shorter. They might be dialogue. Our goal here is to get you familiar with like the skill that's being assessed here versus like the other side of reading, which is like all of these strategies, right? We think of these two kind of separately. There is the overall strategies for parsing through these super long passages. But beyond that, you need to have those core skills of like, how do I close read this passage? How do I pull out the information that's necessary? And like, what, what are these types of questions that I'm going to get? And that's what our focus is on with our practice questions. So in this specific one with text structure, there's a couple different ways that they assess this. One is like overall structure of the text. So I'll give you a couple seconds, I'll give you a minute to do this question um, and see if you can get to the right answer. So let's take a look here. If we go through this dialogue here, we have Miss Murray saying, this is about your family's refugee experience. And Janet's like, my parents aren't refugees. Miss Murray's like, okay, boat people. Parents, she's like, my parents flew here. You mean fled? No, flew. Air Canada, probably. And so it's clear here that Miss Murray is trying to kind of like force this idea or stereotype onto Janet. And she's like continually trying to explain that this is not the case. Um, and so if we look at our choices, they're not coming to a mutual understanding. They seem to very clearly not be able to come to that. It's not that they're disagreeing on a personal issue. And it's not that one is refusing to believe another's claims. It's more that one is like willfully misunderstanding the other. Like Janet's very clearly saying flew and Miss Murray's like, you mean fled. Like she's not refusing to believe it. She's just like, let me misunderstand it actively. And so that's going to be our best answer here. And we get to that by really having an idea of this back and forth, right? Like in that, in that passage we read that was the historical passage with all of the repetition, like that structure was very much like rhetorical questions answering, rhetorical questions answering. That was like the overall high level structure. Here, the overall high level structure is that there's this back and forth, back and forth between two characters who just are like, unable to understand each other, where one is like actively misunderstanding what another one is saying. Let's do another example. Let's take a look at this one. This is about a tonal shift. And so it's still the structure of the passage, but it's like, how are we shifting in tone? So let's take a look at this one. So he starts by saying that he's lucky to raise his children in this world where all of these amazing things have happened. And then he says, he moves on to say like, yes, he still loves America, but he hopes that it can be even better. And so we start with, it doesn't really end with foreboding gloom. It is optimistic, but it doesn't end in like a negative note. He is going from grateful reflection to hopeful anticipation for the future, so that one feels good. He's not really bragging, so that one kind of feels weird. And he is happy and he's musing, but he's not so like 
peaceful and content, right? Content means that you're happy with the way things are. He is really hoping for even more, even a better future. And so our best answer here is going to be B. We really wanna make sure that whatever our answer is captures whatever shift is happening in that passage. Okay. Um, I have one more that I wanna do, and I know I wanna be careful of time, but I think these are, these are important to go through. So this one, I want you to practice the skimming. So I am just gonna give you like a little bit more than a minute and I'll scroll it. I'll scroll it according to the speed that you should be reading it at. So go ahead and start. All right, so if we look at this question, we are looking for the overall structure of the passage. And we start by you know, learning a little bit about Joe, who's really sick and he doesn't have shoes, he doesn't have a home, he doesn't have enough to really take care of himself in terms of income or money. And you know, it's really bleak. He's going to die this like very slow and painful and expensive death and then the authors throw this in just to really shake us and say a decent pair of shoes cost $50. So like all of this expensive medication and, and surgery could have prevented if he had just been able to buy $50 shoes. They're trying to highlight this inefficiency. So if we look at our choices here, the author use realistic details primarily to immerse the reader in a vivid world. Yes, they are doing that, but is that really like the overall structure of this passage? Not really. The doctors present a devastating problem then present a simple solution. That, that feels good, right? This is truly like a devastating problem. And then all of a sudden we get this very simple solution at the end. The authors provide evidence to show how a problem cannot be solved realistically. That's the opposite of what we're seeing. And then the authors provide two sides to an argument before siding with one side. Also not true, there's not two arguments here. Our best answer is this one because it really is capturing the structure, right? Like even if we didn't have any of the words here, like we get a good idea of what's going on by just knowing that we're starting with a devastating problem and then we have this simple solution. If you like think about in school when you have to write like five paragraph essays, it was like an introduction, your body and your conclusion, that's text structure. It's the structure of the text that you're, that you're reading. All right. Let's keep going. So we're going to move on to, let's see, word choice. So this is one where we're being asked, like, why is this specific highlighted phrase or why is like a specific highlighted word? What is the purpose of having that in the passage? So in the context of the passage, we're looking for that highlighted phrase. So I'll give you about a minute to answer this one. Okay, so if we look at the context in the passage, we're seeing what I need is the dandelion in the spring, the bright yellow that means rebirth instead of destruction. So the dandelion in the spring, that yellow is representing like life instead of death. So if we look at our choices, describe an object that reflects the color yellow, not white. Invoke an image of happiness and life. That seems to match more closely to what we want. Paint a picture of the scene, not quite. Draw the reader's attention to a small detail. 
also not quite. The reason, the purpose that this is included is to invoke this image of rebirth instead of destruction. Okay. And then one more category that I want to go through is citing textual evidence. So this is, we kind of looked at what these look like and it really is, you know, we're trying to figure out which piece of evidence best supports a certain claim. Um, and like the format of these sometimes is confusing for students, but really like what you're looking for is just like, which of these choices is going to best support my answer before. I think we've kind of covered this, so we'll not, we won't do one of these practice questions. The last thing for the reading section that I want to go through are just like some of the vocab words that you might be asked about. Um, and this is less like being asked specifically the meaning of this word and more just like these words might show up in questions or in the reading. They're pretty likely to show up somewhere and so it'll be good to know them. The way that I recommend studying these words is to like do passes through them, like cover up part, cover up the definition with like a piece of paper and like quiz yourself. If you don't know it, then like you can click on it and highlight it. And that way when you come back, do a second pass, you just focus on the highlighted ones and then unhighlight the ones that you do remember that time and keep going, keep doing passes until you remember all of them. That was what I used to do to study vocab and I found it to be really effective. So I, I recommend it as a strategy. A couple of words I will point out as being really important to know. Corroborate is really important to know. You need to know that this means support. Um, Context is a really important one because it, it describes the situation that something happens in. We want to really focus on that word because oftentimes the questions will point you to a specific context. And then the last one to definitely know is, let me get to it at the end, undermine. This one is super common. You will, I can almost like 100% say you'll see it. It just means like to weaken something. So like, um, you know, new date, like it might ask you what data would undermine this specific argument. And then you'll have to figure out which one would like most go against the argument in a passage or something like that. So these words are important to know. I recommend going through them like maybe a week before the test and then just like running really quickly through them like a couple of days before the test so that they're fresh in your memory. Okay. So that's all that we're going to cover for reading. Before we move on to writing, are there any questions? Um, the only question I wanted to quickly preface is that some people were wondering um, where to find this list. And so I'm going to actually post the link in the chat, but you can also find all of these resources Lisa's using on our almostfun.org website. Um, so once you get there, click on guides, and then you'll see all the different resources we have related to the SAT. Yeah, and then you can keep practicing problems if you go to our site and press practice now. We have a huge library of questions for you to practice, and each of them comes with like these really helpful explanations. So like you'll be able to walk through it with us basically as if we were there with you, kind of, um, and go through it step by step to get to the answer. And we'll make sure that we try to make sure that it's really obvious how we're getting to the right answer with those explanations. Okay, let's go through the writing section. So the writing section, there's a couple of different styles of questions and the most common one is grammar. So we're gonna run through these grammar rules, kind of running short on time because I, I took my sweet time with reading, um, but I'm going to try and go through as much of this as possible and we'll do some practice. So the really basic thing that you really need to understand is the definition of a sentence, right? A sentence, a complete sentence needs three things. It needs a subject, a verb, and this is the key one, it has to express a complete thought. So like, I eat, great. It's got that subject, a verb, and it's a complete thought. But something like, when I am hungry, tired, angry, or sleepy, that's not a complete thought, even though we do have our subject and we have our verb. And it's not a complete thought because like, we don't know what happens when I feel this way. Like, it, it feels like I'm waiting. If, you, if your sentence ends and you're still, like, waiting for something, then it's not a complete thought. And we need that for a complete sentence. Now, the ways that we connect 
a complete sentence in a fragment, we can either have that fragment first and then a comma and the complete sentence. Or we can have the sentence and then the fragment. Like we don't need a comma in that case. But if we do the fragment first, we do need the comma. It's almost like you're taking a pause. When I'm hungry, tired, angry, or sleepy, I eat. Versus I eat when I'm hungry, tired, angry, or sleepy. There's not really a natural pause there. And then if we have two complete sentences, we can connect them in two ways. We can either add a comma in a transition word. So there are seven transition words called conjunctions that you can use. And those you can remember with the acronym FANBOYS. They are for, and, nor, but, or, yet, and so. And you can connect two sentences that way with the comma in one of these words. Or you can use a semicolon. So that's really helpful for connecting two sentences that are pretty well associated without having to use a comma or a transition word. So let's look at uh, an example question. So I want you to take a look at question four, which is asking you how to combine these two sentences. And if you're not super familiar with the structure for the grammar section, basically we're just looking for how, what we replace this underlined section with from these choices in order to accomplish this goal. So I'll give you like 30 seconds to do that. Okay, so if we look at our choice A, that connects these two complete sentences with a comma and one of our conjunctions. So that's our answer, that's the best one. The other ones, this hyphen and namely, it's not as good. The semicolon and and, that's actually completely incorrect. Remember with the semicolon, we don't add a conjunction. And then the comma and plus the meanwhile, like it just adds too much extra so let's keep it simple. That's one of the biggest uh, things about the writing section is that we want to keep it really simple. And this is the simplest, most correct answer is choice A. Um, let me see. I think I wanted to go through one more. Let me just take a quick look and see if it would be helpful to go through. Yeah. Let's look at uh, number this one 39. Actually, let me go through the skill first. So um, just remember this thing that when we have a fragment, so not a complete thought, we use a comma when it's in the front. And if it's in the back, we don't use a comma. So let's take a look at question 39. I'll give you like 30 seconds. Okay, so we can't leave it the way that it is because this is a fragment. It's not a complete sentence. Because their new qualifications give them opportunities for advancement within the company, there's nothing after that. We don't know what happens because of this. And so we can't leave it as no change. We have to do something. This colon is not how we connect a complete sentence in a fragment. A semicolon is how we connect two complete sentences. This one is the only correct one because it just directly connects our fragment to the end of our sentence. So our answer here is choice C. All right, let's keep going. So this is really important. Um, I often see students get this, these types of questions wrong. We don't wanna be wordy. We really wanna say things in clear, simple ways. It might be that all of the choices are actually technically grammatically correct but that they are too overcomplicated. There's too many extra words. There's like too much going on. So let's take a look at an example of this. We'll get two examples. I think both are kind of helpful to look at. Um, okay, do this first question.
So see how like this and is simple. It's enough. It's just we're saying the reading material has a hard time competing with television, radio, and other media. These other choices, like we don't need to repeat the with, we don't need to say and also, we don't need to say and competing with, like there's no extra value being added with those extra words. So there's just no need. Like unless there was something really special that was getting added by saying and with, there's no reason to add those extra words and the simplest, clearest answer is just gonna be and. Here's a more obvious example of this problem. So let's look at question eight. So with this one, all we're trying to say is after nine months, the cat in the hat was complete. We don't need to say at the end of a duration, nine months long, right? This means the exact same thing as nine months later, but this uses like a hundred words and this one uses three or this one after 36 weeks or nine months had passed. Like, unless I really want to know how many weeks are in nine months, this is not helpful to the reader. So this is a really extreme example, but basically like throughout these questions, if it feels like all the answers are technically correct, the next thing you're looking for is simplicity. Okay. This is also one that can be hard to, to tell, but we generally want to be using an active voice. And an active voice means that our, we're using our subject and then our verb and then our object. A passive voice means that our object actually comes first. So like, remind me tomorrow on my computer has been hit by me for a hundred years versus I've been hitting remind me tomorrow on my computer for a hundred years. This one is active voice because I have my subject, my verb, and then my object. Whereas in this case, I have my object, my verb, and then the by me, my subject at the end. And that's generally not what we want. So let's take a look at an example of this. Um, yeah, let's look at number question 13. So see how in the uh, current one, we have our object, our verb, and then our subject. So this is in passive voice. We don't really want this. We look at choice B, more people use public transportation if they do not have to pay a fare. That reads a little easier, right? We have our subject, we have our verb, and we have our object. If people do not have to pay a fare, more of these people use public transportation. This is technically in active voice, but there's a lot of repetition, right? We say people twice and we don't really need to. Choice D, using public transportation is done by more people when they do not have to pay a fare. This is passive voice again, right? We have actually a weird combination of verb, object, verb, subject. There's like too complicated. Our simplest, most clear way of saying this using active voice is choice B. Uh, let me show you one more example that highlights this pretty clearly. Let's see. Oh, I need to go to writing. Okay. Read through this problem and see if you can answer it correctly. So I like this question because I think it really highlights how weird passive voice can sound. Like, but I do know you can be loved past your pain by me. It just like reads a little funky. Like it doesn't sound super clear or like loving you past your pain can be done by me. Our verb is like way too complicated. Why do we have to say can be done by? Or loving you past your pain, that can be done by me. Like that also just feels a little bit funky, right? It's not easy to say. 
Whereas this is like such a nice, simple way of saying it in our active voice. I can love you past your pain. So easy, so clear. I know exactly what it means on one read. So that's our best answer here. Okay, let's keep going. So list of items. Um, this is important both grammatically in terms of punctuation and also just like style and form. So there's three basic rules here. Uh, I don't know why this is two things. It should say three things. So we, when we have items that don't have commas themselves, we separate them with commas. If the items do have commas, so like these city uh, country pairings, then we separate them with semicolons. And then the last thing is like, if it's a little bit more complicated, then we need each of these to be in the same form. So like, see how the verbs are in the same tense and they start with the verb and then the object or, you know, the, basically like the verb is the first thing that we see. So let's do an example of this. Let's do question 12. Okay, so see how each of these items, we have helping at a local animal shelter, working at a healthcare facility. That means that the second one needs to be in that same format, right? Our verb needs to end in ing. So the only one that does that is choice D, helping at a local animal shelter, picking up litter, working at a healthcare facility. These other two, these other three are not in the same format, so those are not the right answers. And then one more practice, just to make sure you remember the things I mentioned. Let's do this one. Okay, so for this one, see how like in, in our list items, we have this comma, we have the gold Gryffindor lion emblazoned on scarlet, the black badger of Hufflepuff set against yellow, and the bronze eagle of Ravenclaw on blue. Our items themselves have commas, so we can't separate them with commas. It would get too confusing. We separate them with semicolons. So this is already done correctly. Okay. Let's keep going. So dashes and parentheses are both used to like set off um, modifiers, but parentheses have to be used in a pair. Dashes can either be used in a pair or on their own, like you're taking a long pause. So like they also provide more emphasis, like you're taking a long pause or something like that. Parentheses. Uh, you can't use one by itself. They have to come in a pair. So they kind of bookend a modifier that you're using. I'm not going to go through an example for these because I feel like that should be pretty clear. Um, maybe actually one example that is helpful to look at when you find it is this one is when you're trying to figure out how to like end a modifier. So like here after Hawaii, one good strategy is to go back and see what did it start with. If it started with a comma, it's going to end with a comma. If it started with a parentheses, it's going to end with the parentheses. If it started with a hyphen, it's got to end with a hyphen. So whenever you have a modifier inside the middle of a sentence, it's going to be bookended by the same punctuation. So you can look forward to see what the right one is. Keep going. So possessives are also really important to know. Um, I think, you know, most people know that if you have a singular noun that does not end in S, you add apostrophe S. The one that I see folks mess up is that if you have a singular noun that ends in S, you add apostrophe S. You don't just add an apostrophe, you still add apostrophe S. A plural that's possessive, you add apostrophe S. And the only case where you only add an apostrophe 
is if you have a plural noun that ends in s. So let's take a quick example of this. Um, let me see. Okay, so this one is really important. Um, I think that this might be a little bit tricky, so actually read through this and see if you can get the right answer. And remember, only, I don't know if I mentioned this, but only read the sentence that the word is in. Don't read the whole thing. Okay, so this one's a little bit tricky because it could just be one parent. We might not actually know that for sure, except that here we have the pronoun there. So we know that it's two, it's both parents. And so when we say by my parents love, this needs to be the plural possessive, which is gonna be parents and then apostrophe. So that's gonna be our right answer. So be careful for some of the words that um, you're not sure, it's not clear exactly if it's plural or singular, make sure you read the whole sentence so that you can, you can find those hints. Okay. Contractions are, I'm just gonna share the trick that, that we use to remember these, like especially if you're sometimes getting confused between it's I-T-S and it's I-T apostrophe S. Um, think of the apostrophe as like a shortcut for a letter. So like the apostrophe is there to replace the I, or like the apostrophe here is there to replace the A. So anytime you see an apostrophe, you should think, oh, it's replacing a letter. So it should be they are, or it is. And that's like a, a kind of an easy trick to help you remember the difference between IT apostrophe S and ITS, um, or Y-O-U R and Y-O-U apostrophe R-E. Um, okay, let's look at colons. So colons and hyphens can, are kind of similar when they set off something on its own, except that um, colons, they usually are used to like clear up something that was mentioned before. So like it's kind of like being set up. So here, there's only one man who should be the next James, James Bond. That's setting up Idris Elba, who's been presented after the colon. Um, and it can be just one word or it can be a full sentence. So this is, that man is Idris Elba, that's a full sentence. We can also use that here with the colon. But it can't separate like, um, it can't be used in the same way that hyphens or parentheses are used to like separate a modifier. You can't use them on either side of something like this. That would not work. Um, okay, I'm going to keep going just so we can get through all of this. So we talked about this before. Semicolons can be used instead of like a period to connect two sentences. Um, that's really their main usage, but they can also be used to separate items in a list if those list items have commas in them. We don't want to use them in place of like a comma. Um, unless it's a comma and a conjunction, but not a comma by itself. Okay, comparisons. This one's super important. You'll definitely see questions about this. Um, comparison questions are really testing whether or not you can structure a sentence so that like two things that are being compared are compared correctly. So if we look at this sentence, Brianna is richer than any other fem female musician is. You might be tempted to say that like you want to say Brianna is richer than any other female musician or Rihanna is richer than any female musician is. So we actually need every part of this sentence. We need the other because Rihanna is richer than the other female musicians because all female musicians includes herself and she can't be richer than herself. So we need the other here. And we need the verb here too because whatever is being compared before the van, it needs to be in the same structure. So Rihanna is like you'll find the comparison word because it'll end in er like whatever is around this so rihanna is and any other fem female musician is those need to match in terms of like whether or not there's a verb or if it's a noun and a verb or just a noun um let's take a look at an example this one is a little bit tricky i think i got it wrong my first 
tried, but see if you can get it right and be better than me. We're going to do question 20. Okay, so here our comparison word is significantly less than, so it's less than, and then we want to compare what's before it and what's afterwards. So here we have they, then, did, so we have a noun and we have a verb, which means afterwards we need a noun and we need a verb also. So then did students who were, that has both the noun and the verb, than hours worked by students. This one is not quite the same. It's got a different verb than this one, so it's not as good. Compared with students, this one doesn't have our, our did verb here. So the answer here is B, because we need it to look as similar as possible to the part before, and this one is the one that does, because it has both the verb did as well as the subject students. So our answer here is B. These are really tricky. We have a couple of like easier ones on our site to kind of help you get used to them. Um, so for example, actually let me go through it. Um, this one is like a little bit easier to get a hold of. I'll just go over it quickly. Like we have someone who is even closer to God than Ricky Martin. We have even closer than is our comparison. So Ricky Martin is not enough. We also need to have is in there, right? To be the same. So our answer here is Ricky Martin is choice B. I'll just go ahead and answer it. Okay, let's keep going. This is pretty basic that we want to use I when it's the subject and me when it's the object. Be really careful about this, especially when we have two people. Um, so like any other team can be beaten by Jasmine and me, not Jasmine and I. That's something to be careful about. Pronouns are also, they can be a little bit tricky because there's this really important part of this called pronoun clarity. Um, I'm gonna skip down to that actually. So pronoun clarity is like, anytime you use a pronoun like he or she or them or it, it needs to be really clear what that pronoun is referring to. So if we look at this example here, um, actually let's just do the problem together. Yeah, go ahead and do this problem. Okay, so the problem here is that we have he and him here, and we have no idea which one is Black Panther, rest in power, and which one is the young militant. So this is, this, there's no pro, pronoun clarity here. We don't know which one is which. And so we need to change this he to something that's much more specific. The man, we still don't know which one that is. The person, both of them are people. And so the only one that gives us pronoun clarity is gonna be actually replacing it with Black Panther. So we know exactly who it is that he is and who him is. Here's an example of it from the SAT. So I think here, question 15. Let's look at 15 here. Okay. So in this case, we have a study by the Royal Institute of Technology found that car traffic in Tallinn was down less than 3% since it was enacted. It's super unclear what it is referring to. Um, and so the way that we clarify that is by changing it to the policy, right? Even without reading before that, we can kind of tell like it, that one, all could all are like pretty general and vague but it's a little interesting right that the policy is so specific and different and that ends up being our answer because it adds clarity to the sentence it becomes really clear what that pronoun is referring to 
All right, let's keep going. The other thing is pronoun agreement. A lot of stuff with pronouns here. So if the thing that the pronoun is referring back to is singular, then we have to use a singular pronoun. So in this case, the creature is singular. So the pronoun we use to refer back to it also has to be singular. It can't be plural. Um, let me show you an example of that. Is this one? Oh, this is actually a different one. Hold on. Let me find. Oh, okay. I might not have one from the SAT that I pointed out, but check out this one. Let's take like 30 seconds. So in this case, those is the pronoun referring to eat, pray, love, thing. In this case, this is singular and this is plural, so that can't work. And is singular and this is plural, that also doesn't work. Those is plural and this is singular, still doesn't work. Those is plural and things is plural, that one works for us. And the thing I want to note about this is like one is singular, we're saying one of those and this is what that's referring to. So one is not referring back to eat, pray, love things. It's those that's referring back to it. And so that's what we want to be careful about. Okay, let's go to subject verb agreement. So this is also really important and will definitely be on the bus. Um, if your subject is singular, your verb needs to be in the singular form. If your subject is plural, your verb needs to be in the plural form. So let's take an example question. Um, oh, actually, this one is the one I was talking about for pronoun agreement. Let's go ahead and do this one first, actually, so you get an idea. So we're going to do question 23. Okay, so first we need to figure out what they is referring back to. And if we read the sentence, upon arrival of the digital camera, professional photographers harumph that they produced ugly low resolution images. The thing that produced the ugly low resolution images is the camera, which is singular. So here we need to use a singular noun, pronoun. And a camera is not a he or a she. One is not quite right. The answer here is gonna be it that it produced ugly low resolution images, singular matching with singular. Okay, I think this subject verb agreement might be the one I don't have an example question for, but um, in general, the singular form of a verb, and like there are some tricky rules ar around this and like uh, exceptions, but generally the singular version of it ends in S and the plural version doesn't. So a person wants and people want. So just, you know, be wary of like, especially if there's a lot of modifiers in there, identifying what is my actual subject and what's my actual verb and like make sure that they match because that'll definitely be on the test. Okay, verb tenses. We have a lot of them and I'm not gonna go through all of them, but you should um, after the session, as you're preparing for the test, go through these and make sure you understand like when to use each one um, because that'll be super important. And there's a lot of different ones and there's a lot of different styles for them, but you actually will have a lot of like prior knowledge just based on like how you, you know, you've been speaking English for most of your life for a lot of you. And so there should be some like intuition around what certain ones feel right and which ones don't feel right. So let's do an example. Uh, let's see. We are gonna do question 23. So like, if we kind of rely a little bit on our intuition, scientists are long believing, sounds a little weird. Scientists will long be believing is a little bit clunky. Like it, 
kind of seems like it means they will, in the future, they will believe this for a while. And that doesn't quite seem like what we want. Scientists have long believed. That sounds a little bit better, right? Like long believed means like for a while. So they believe this for a while, they continue to believe it, have long believed. Scientists long believe is present tense. And that's a little weird because long implies a long period of time. And present tense is very much like specifically right now, not like a longer period of time. So our answer here is C. And if you go back here, you can see like um, the different versions of the, the verbs and how have verb plus id, that means that like something recently happened or is still happening. It's like kind of uncertain the total time frame, but it's for a period of time, right? Where something that's present is something that happens regularly in the present and is like, you know, in a specific moment in time, not a period of time. Okay, let's keep going. Verb shifts are something else that's really important. We don't want to, this is, you should also pay attention to this in your personal statement, because I see this a lot in personal statements and in writing in general, and it can really throw people off. Don't change the tense of your verb randomly. You want to be really intentional about the tenses that you're using, right? So in this example here, we create and perceive our world simultaneously. These are both in present tense, and our mind will do this without us ever knowing. There's no reason for us to change to future tense here. Like there's no, there's no reason why that's happening in the future, even though this is happening in the present. It just serves to like confuse a little bit. And so we want to make sure that this is also in present tense because that's the, that's the clearest, simplest way to express this thought. Um, I'm going to stop going through example problems and just try to run through these last few topics in the last minute that we have. So adverbs, uh, these describe other verbs and other adjectives. And this is kind of tricky because they generally need to end in ly, but like it can often sound correct even if you don't. So the example here, I eat healthy by limiting the number of Cheetos I eat. That sounds correct, but it's actually not. You need to say I eat healthily. That's the adverb form of healthy. And then last thing, modifiers. So modifiers help describe a subject, a verb, or an object. They're like an extra part of the sentence that if you got rid of, you would still have a complete sentence. So the example that I like to look at, because I think it's a good example of this, is this, oh, not this one. This one, and that's gonna, this is gonna be the last question that we do tonight. So go ahead and try this one. Okay, so in this case, we have the modifier like all babies, and this is modifying his potential. His potential is not a baby, and so this modifier is not modifying the correct thing. We need whatever is here to be something or someone that is a baby. So potentially, that's also not correct. His enormous potential has the same issue. This is the only correct one because he is the baby so like all babies, he has enormous potential. This is where we have our modifier correctly modifying our, our subject or our noun. Um, so this is something to be careful of because it can sound correct in your head, but it might not actually be when you think about like, what is it actually modifying? And that is everything that we have to cover tonight. Um, I didn't go through all the practice problems that I wanted to just to because of time. Um, so. If you want to study some more, all of our content is available for free at almostfun.org. You can practice all of these questions. And um, if you master these skills well, then you are just going to be better prepared for the SAT when you take it. I'm going to stop screen sharing now and just see if there are any questions we need to go through. So there's only one uh, general SAT question on the, on the queue, and that's just general recommendations for how to I just realized I was muted. Uh, there's only one question uh, that's about the general SAT process, which is just like suggestions and general recommendations for how to stay awake or energized throughout the whole SAT test. Yeah, um, I mean, this is tough. Like, I think that for the reading section, doing the speed reading exercises will actually help. So there's two types of people 
I mean, I hate to generalize, but like some people take tests and like get really anxious. And so there's a lot of nervous energy that you actually need to calm down. And then there's some that when they're taking the test, they like get really bored and like don't want to do it. And it just kind of sucks. And I think that if you're in the first camp, then like uh, you want to do strategies that are going to like help you focus. And if you're in the second group, then you want to use strategies that are going to like keep you actively thinking. So like the speed reading strategies are going to be more helpful for you because they're going to push you to like actively read, like you're timing yourself, you're like really being um, aggressive about like how you're spending your seconds at a time and, and keeping yourself accountable that way. But that's really like the best recommendation that I have. You want to give yourself like a sense of urgency, right? It is three and a, three, almost four hours, but like it's, you're only going to do this a couple times. And so you want to like feel urgent in the test and like be able to complete it and not, you know, waste time or, or forget about, you know, answering the questions. Um, okay, for non-native speakers, we don't have that intuition for grammar questions. Does reading more help with that? Yeah, reading more helps. Honestly, like watching shows helps as well because you're hearing it. And like the more you hear it, it actually is better than just reading it because you'll like start to get used to it. And then when you read the SAT questions in your head, like it's that active listening, you know, that's engaged. And so like, I honestly recommend watching like certain sitcom shows like that. I know that's really weird advice for preparing for the SAT, but like it's been shown, studies have shown that like a good way of learning a new language is to watch shows in that language because you're forced to like listen to it and hear it. And like, don't rely on the subtitles, you know, really like listen to what they're saying. Yeah, um, I definitely co sign That's actually how I learned English myself. French was my first language. And we watched a lot of, I watched a lot of Saturday morning cartoons and now I speak English. <laughs> yeah. And her English is great. You can't even tell. So. <laughs> okay, what extracurriculars and volunteering activities did you do in high school? So yeah, we've, we've kind of gone through this in the last couple of sessions. We'll do like a brief overview quickly of like what each of us, what our packets generally kind of look like. And then we're gonna, you know, end the questions on those. Um, so I, I had a pretty high GPA. I was um, like in the top ranking of my class. Um, I also had a perfect SAT score, but I did take it twice. I did not have a very strong ACT score, so I didn't report that. Um, and then my extracurriculars and volunteering were like a little bit weaker. Like I had some clubs, but like really I was more of a well-rounded, strong academic student. Yeah, um, for me, since similar, I had a pretty strong GPA, was top of the class. Um, when it came to like the SATs and ACTs, my scores were above average, but definitely like not like, you know, above like super high or whatever um and I didn't know I didn't I didn't need to report them so I still reported them but I still got it um and then extracurriculars were mostly like sports I did I like I played volleyball in high school and then was pretty involved with our our international club cool. um I did not have a part-time job so I don't think required um based yeah. on <laughs> I didn't have one either. I had one after I graduated high school, like the summer before college. Subway was my first job. Cool. All right. I think that's all the questions. Um, oh, does Almost Fun offer college admissions guides too? We have guides on writing your personal statement. We're working on putting out more guides for like navigating the financial aid process, filling out your common app, stuff like that. So those will be coming soon. But right now, if you're getting started on your personal statement, which you should get started on early, we do have guides for those. And, and um, we think they're pretty helpful and like a unique way of thinking about that statement. So all of this is available at almostfun.org. All right, thank you so much, you guys. We've been so excited to be able to spend this time with all of you and to help answer your questions and go through all this content. Um, if you have more questions, you can email us, email us at help at almostfun.org. And we're happy to answer those there, but we're going to let everyone go for, you know, relax for the rest of your Friday night. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye.